Thanks, and uh, there's so many of you for such an early hour. I think that's kind of impressive. Um, so uh, thank you, Emily and Fergus and Taylor, for inviting me to say something about this. I, the title I've been given to work with is The Landscape of Historical Practice. I didn't pick it. Um, I took it to actually mean that this is a highly biased old man's talk summarizing a decade of work that feels like a lifetime ago. Um, <laughs> Uh, but work that I'm immensely proud of and brings back memories of dear colleagues and students. And while I have you, I want to emphasize that this isn't some crazed techno-positivist talk about sensing curing the world's ills, um, but instead an attempt to highlight the creative potential of these technologies and something that I think you'll see during the lightning talks today. And also, uh, I want you to notice how um, over the decade that we were at SENS, um, our understanding of phenomena and the tools we used to sense them proceeded in a kind of co-evolution. So our understanding of the world and our ability to sense it evolved. Um, okay, so enough with the title slide. Um, so as Taylor said, I was with um, a co-principal co investigator on something called SENS, the Center for Embedded Network Sensing. Um, it was a, uh, and it, we just wrapped up two years, a year and a half ago. Um, uh, 10-year investment on the part of the NS National Science Foundation, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, what the uh, Science and Technology Center is and whatever later. Um, uh, I am going to, uh, it, it did give me a chance, though, to think about this talk, to go back over a decade's worth of site visit slides and material that we spoke about. So anytime a slide has a sort of green border around it, it's a, like a, a little, like an artifact that I found on, a, on, a, on one of my, so this is uh, one of the last slides that the, the principal investigator, Deborah Estrin, who's now at uh, Cornell Tech, actually, um, uh, I, I guess we just couldn't. Uh, we couldn't both stay in LA without the, but anyway, um, uh, on sort of wireless sensing and the theme of the talk that I'm going to uh, follow today uh, sort of borrows from the spirit of one of these last talks she gave uh, as part of SENS, which is on uh, moving monitoring or moving sensing from ecosystems to human systems. And that's sort of the arc that, uh, that the, the center that I was with uh, uh, followed. Um, this is another beautiful slide that uh, was the, typically how we started talks. Um, that issues facing science, government, and the public call for high fidelity, real-time observations of the physical world. Our tagline was that embedded sensing, sort of systems of networks, networks of sensors, would reveal the previously unobservable. And that, to me, seems to make its own case for journalism. Um, and in fact, we used to joke that as the last year of SENS ticked over, because UCLA didn't have a school of journalism, it felt like SENS should just move over into a, a school of journalism. But well, here we are. Um, all right, so I thought what I would do, given the old man nature of this talk, is to talk a little bit about some of the precedents of, um, of or precedents for, for network sensing uh, that led up to, um, that led up to the work we were doing at SENS, just to give you a sense of how um, sensing or the concept of sensing or networks of sensors has changed. Um, you can point to a lot of precedents, um, maybe the earliest being uh, Alan Turing in his paper on intelligent machinery where he writes about distributing human sensing. So not just talking about intelligence, but talking about distributing the sensing capabilities, human sensing capabilities, um, perhaps using uh, a microphone, uh, uh, a television for eye, uh, oh, sorry, camera for eyes, um, and so on. Uh, computers at the time, though, to control this assemblage of sensing equipment were sort of big, so he was a little worried that uh, you'd end up making something that was so large uh, that the brain part would have to be stationary and you'd have this other kind of sensing thing you'd send into the world. Um, uh, and he says that in order that the machine should have a chance of finding things out there for itself, it should be allowed to roam the countryside and the danger to the ordinary citizen would be serious. So at some point he decided <laughs> that this whole thing is maybe not exactly what you what you would uh, what you would want um, for better for uh, so, so uh, you can also look for uh, other kinds of there are lots of other sort of practices that you could you could look to for historical precedents for using wireless communication to help acquire a better vantage point to observe physical phenomena as early as the 1930s you had atmospheric scientists am I doing that um, uh, deploying radio sons that are balloon borne instruments that would give you measurements as they sort of went through the atmosphere. So you had measurements being taken um, uh, 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 as, as, the balloon, as the balloon rose, which gave you. Is that me or is that. Okay. Um, all right. So. Um, uh, and and the, the idea here, though, is that, is that uh, you want to sense something remotely, and so you send the sensor there, right? And we'll come back to that topic in, in a bit. Um, for better or for worse, though, the, the, um, one of the major uh, uh, 
sources of inf inspiration that, that founded the, the center I was part of um, came from, do you have an idea? Yeah. Uh, came from the military. Um, so I spent some time talking to uh, uh, the, the two engineers, uh, uh, Greg Potty and, and Bill Kaiser, who are sort of largely credited as being the, the inventors of uh, sensor networks or the idea of a sensor network. And their sort of main motivation was uh, uh, military applications. Um, and in particular took inspiration from uh, some, uh, 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 a, uh, a military project called Igloo White, which was a monitoring, a chain of monitoring sensors along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, uh, the, the characteristics of this, um, of this monitoring system, uh, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, the, the, mo the kinds of monitors that were being uh, placed, the kinds of sensors that were being placed were being uh, tossed out of aircraft, so you have ad hoc deployment, that is you're just sort of scattering the sensors in the environment. Um, uh, they would then sort of act autonomously and then low flying planes would come and harvest the data and then you would have roomfuls of people who were interpreting the data to decide if someone, if there was a truck or some sort of troop movement along the trail. Um, the upper figure showing places where their like, trucks had been destroyed and so on. Um, and the bottom sort of been recounting the history. Other kinds of sensors in addition to accelerometers were on these, on these, uh, on these uh, uh, sort of ad hoc deployed sensors, including a kind of people sniffer, which was a chemically sense, which would chemically sense sweat and urine to tell that sort of people were walking by. Um, so I bring up this example because it has the characteristics of, of, of a kind of early sensor network um, deployment. That is, there are power constraints. You've thrown a sensor into the environment, and the sensor is going to run on a battery. And when it's out of battery, there's no more data. Okay, so since there's power constraints, there's communication limitations, right? So someone, a plane has to fly by and co collect all the data. Um, the deployments are ad hoc, that is you're not designing where you put the sensors, but you're throwing them sort of out of a plane, quite literally hoping that they land in a place where there's some sort of vantage, uh, where they have vantage on, on people moving across the trail. Um, and there's an interesting interplay between automated versus human interpretation of the data. Um, so 30 years after Igloo White, as I said, Greg Potty and Bill Kaiser uh, started looking at um, the demands of sort of modern battlefield deployments. Um, uh, but this time around, we'd seen you know, talk of ubiquitous computing. Wireless technology had become a lot more mature. Um, and sensing had become a lot better, a lot smaller. Uh, miniaturization had taken hold. Um, and so out of, out, of, uh, out of this UCLA group came a kind of vision where um, uh, uh, low cost uh, sensors, signal processing, communication, and actuation all came together to provide a kind of monitoring, uh, monitoring platform. And this was from a proposal, an ARPA proposal in 1994. Um, out of this came some simple nodes, uh, low powerless wireless integrated microsensors or LWIM nodes um, that were again specifically uh, designed for sort of battlefield um, applications. Uh, as you move along, though, we, we quickly jump out of the battlefield right? um, uh, uh, and demilitarize the technology. Um, in 2001, the National Academy of Sciences published a, a, a landmark report in, uh, in sort of in the history of sensor networks called Embedded Everywhere, um, which suggested a kind of digital nervous system that would uh, sort of coat the globe and allow you to both monitor and in turn possibly control certain aspects of the, of the environment. Um, embedded everywhere, uh, highlighted um, uh, certain uh, uh, research challenges for the next decade or so, things like uh, the predictability and manageability of sensing systems, their adaptive self-configuration, meaning if a sensor goes down, uh, how does, this, is, does the whole system come down or, or is it able to heal itself? How do, you, how do you monitor and assess the system health? What kind of computational models are, pr are present? Um, uh, and so on. Um, and they defined sort of a sensor network as multiple interacting nodes, um, that they would be autonomous, that is collecting data without direct human intervention for the most part, um, that they weren't general purpose computing devices, but instead single purpose, they were there to monitor a particular thing, um, and that they could be deployed in either natural or, or engineered contexts. Um, and then, so, so in early, so this is 
sort of very early before things were really actually deployed, and the mathematicians, ah, bless their heart, um, sort of rush in and take control of things, right? So before you have a single uh, sensor deployed, or, or much less, you know, 100 or 1,000 of them, you have mathematicians blowing it up to some asymptotic limit to talk about the ability of sensors to communicate, the ability of networks, how, how, how dense the things have to be to, um, to be able to self-organize, what are the information limits uh, possible from, a, from sensing systems and so on, um, and you had some sort of beautiful, uh, even uh, 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 control uh, uh, logic around how information was shuttled through the sensor network. Um, this is a, a, like one of the early classic papers, uh, something called directed diffusion, where you imagine this scattered network of thousands of sensors, you with a little desktop on the other side saying, gee, I wonder what the temperature in Pago Pago is, and the network sort of randomly, and then the information is diffused toward you and you get an answer five degrees or whatever it might be, right? So, so there's this, this sort of mathematization that happens in the early 2000s. Um, uh, 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 right. And then also what happens is uh, as, as mathematicians take over, you get kind of scaling laws and a kind of dust metaphor emerges. The idea that you might have um, smart dust, that is sensors that are so small that they're a bit like dust and you sort of scatter them, they self-organize, they talk to one another and, and so on. Um, the smart dust analogy actually for me was a little difficult to take because at about the same time, this is what sensors look like. Um, <laughs> this is also what a phone looked like, so I kind of love this slide. Again, this is an archaeological exhibition, or uh, I think for me. So, so this is what the phone looked like, and these are what the companies that were trying to sell the thing called dust, uh, this is what their products looked like. Um, and at the time, actually, the, the, uh, there's an interesting thing that happens, and now that I think about this, these are, you know, this, that this particular figure in one of our papers, that eventually what happens with SENS is that we stop looking at specialized, uh, specialized sensing devices and started giving over to the mobile phone and the, the network as it exists, using that as the, as the communication platform. Um, but at the time, um, the, there were a lot of studies about, about because of the low power nature of sensors about you know how much time should you spend measuring something, how much time should you spend communicating something, how much time should you spend with the GPS. So they're all very detailed computations about how much power was going into it. So power was sort of key, right? Operating these things, long live systems for, uh, with, with power. Um, and then somewhere around 2002, 2003, we hit uh, embedded network sensing 2.0. And this is about where I came into the thing. I joined UCLA, SENS was just starting, I became a co-PI. Um, and what happened is, and this was also about the time that people started bringing sensors into the environment and deploying them. So packets were getting dropped, batteries died, sensors failed, little cheap hardware in the environment behaves exactly like you would expect little cheap hardware in the environment to behave, right? So data didn't come back and eventually they were like, wait, 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 we need a, stat we need a statistician to come and help us with the signal processing. So um, that image of a cloud of thousands of autonomous sensors doing something receded into the medium to long term and a new set of challenges emerged. Um, and so uh, SENS as a, as a center was all about making those deployments, going out and putting sensors in the environment and, and, and actually trying experiments. Um, so this is the homepage again. Um, as I said, SENS was a science and technology center. It's one of the largest investments that NSF makes. It's a $40 million investment over 10 years. There were 60 faculty, something like 100 students. It was not an inconsequential deal. Um, now the, the hallmark, instead of sort of flat monolithic systems that appeared like sort of scattered dust, um, the, the, the networks, uh, embedded network sensing 2.0 had sort of different, different tenants. Um, there was more purposeful placement of sensors, right? Thinking that instead of just throwing them in the environment, well, these actually are kind of expensive at the moment, so maybe we could kind of put them somewhere nicely. Um, that we could consider rapid deployments um, that are short-lived versus long-lived systems. So something that when something happens, you rapidly deploy and you put something down for watch. Um, that there should be more systems to support human in the loop analysis um, and in situ tools for, for monitoring and alerting. Um, that mobility and actuation and multi scale methods allowed you to achieve greater spatial resolution. So we'll look at some examples in, in, in a second, but, but that idea of like either the igloo-wide idea or the idea of scattering sensors out in some remote place and letting them collect data, well that sensor is going to sit wherever it landed and just sort of feed back uh, uh, data at, at high temporal resolution. So it's just sitting, sitting there clicking over, sending you as much information about one particular place as, as it can. 
Um, the problem is that if you have a sensor here and a sensor here, you don't really know what's going on in between. I mean, you can make a model for it, right? That's where you hire a statistician. Or you could maybe in involve uh, some robotics that has the, the sensor moving from place to place, right? And, and that sort of mobility becomes an interesting concept in this 2.0 version of, of sensing. Um, there's also greater reliance on the models for the phenomena under study, so there was much more use of, of statistical or mathematical models that were helping to bridge those gaps in between the sensors, and that data quality and data integrity became important themes that were not imagined when the mathematicians held held court. Um, that in fact, data quality and um, uh, data integrity were deal breakers if you didn't get them right. Right. So, like I said, lots of cheap stuff in the environment will give you lots of cheap data. Right. Um, so, so we've seen this before. The, the sort of theme of the center was about was about um, getting out into the environment and doing experiments. Um, uh, uh, again, we're trying to reveal that we were trying to reveal the previously unobservable, um, and that it was distinct from remote sensing because the remote sensing involves sort of from the top looking down. The sensor network sensor networks involved from the bottom looking looking up. In effect. Um, that, uh, in, that there were a host of, of sort of, of um, environmental monitoring applications that we looked at um, from from uh, from seismic uh, from seismic networks to um, to agriculture to, uh, to to water systems, um, and that we imagined a kind of ecology of sensing that had static sensing systems, robotic sensing systems. Um, sort of human in the loop, all overlaid with, let's say, big picture events from remote sensing. Um, and again, these are all the green bordered, so you can, this is, this is what science looks like. So, um, and we had this uh, sort of case studies like, you know, sort of, let's think about water and sensing around water. Um, so can you maybe track pollution and where it comes from? And in Los Angeles, um, we had uh, sort of around Malibu, we had very poor water quality. Could you track why? Maybe looking back to you know, where, where things came from when we had beach closings. Um, could you look at, um, through rapidly deployed technology, when there's a, a major rain event in Los Angeles, can you rally sort of resources to be able to measure, um, uh, measure things in a, in a quick way? Um, and so on. So, so these were the kinds of pictures that we would produce. So, a world sort of replete with sensing, sensing uh, uh, capabilities. Um, the New York Times actually ran a little piece on SENS and had a beautiful, a beautiful graphic called "The Wired Woodlands" that tried to get at all the different experiments that were in play at, at the time. Um, everything from sort of robotic. I'll talk about the sort of robotic thing in a second. Um, to uh, instrumented nest boxes to track sort of bird bird habits to um, to uh, mini rhizotroms that were looking at root growth. Um, so here's an example of the kind of thing that we would drag our students on deployment. So these were this is a multidisciplinary um, uh, endeavor. So we would have statistics students. Um, computer science students, biology students, engineers all kind of schlepped off to some sort of remote place to, to sense something. So this is uh, Lake Fulmore. It's part of the James Reserve, uh, 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 which is part of the UC Reserve system. It's an urban lake. Uh, these buoys that you see here are each dangling uh, st uh, strands of sensors, uh, each at, a, at a, a, a meter deeper than the next that are measuring things like temperature and chlorophyll content and, and so on in the water. Um, and in addition to that, um, a, a deployment might have um, this sort of shuttle that, that moved across the, across the lake and dropped a kind of sensor payload that allowed you to take measurements anywhere within this sort of, sort of, uh, sort of transect to basically take a cross section of, of the lake. Um, and he, in this case, what we were doing was, was looking at uh, the migration of phytoplankton, which is a tough thing to try to explain the computer science and the engineers, right? They're just like, oh, we make, you know, we make wireless, we make, you know, and, and the biologists would say, but then the phytoplankton and the thermoclines, and when the temperature gave, then the phytoplankton could move, and isn't that awesome? And this is the first time we're seeing that. This is the first time we're seeing it, and they're like, uh, hmm. um, but so part of it was to try to make the the two sort of groups talk. But anyway. Um, uh, so, 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 what this kind of deployment shows you is that you can have, uh, or what we, the, the kinds of the kinds of work that we did was, 
Static sensing, the buoys didn't go anywhere, sort of collecting data in real time, so chlorophyll measurements happening at a really fine time scale. And then you have this robotic thing that allows you to move and take a measurement anywhere within the, the transect, right? So you now have high spatial resolution. So you have the two kind of uh, playing off one another. How much time do I have left? Five, oh boy, okay. Um, and then we did other things like this was, uh, how much? Five, no, no okay. Um, uh, another, another. we dragged the students up to the White Mountains uh, to a, uh, 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 a fell field. Fell field, Scottish word for field of rocks. Um, so this Arctic fell field where we were looking at differences in, in temperature and why certain types of plants grew up certain other places. And this is another one of our robotic systems that would go back and forth and make these sort of temperature profiles over time of, of, this, of the surface. Um, and then last one, uh, robotic. <clears throat> this is at um, uh, the confluence of um, uh, the Merced River. of two rivers coming together, one polluted, one not. The Merced and the San Joaquin River, one polluted, one not. We stretched our sensors across and had the robot do a slice, and you could see polluted half and not polluted half in terms of, let's say, some pollution measures. So you start to see the, the um, uh, you start to see phenomena that you knew had to be there, but you couldn't sort of directly measure before. And I bring this up because it wasn't all robotic, this and water and whatever. This is a series of um, sap flow monitors that one of our ecologists put in so you could actually watch the movement of sap through a tree over the course of the day, which was a kind of awesome thing. Um, and then we spent some time thinking that, you know, sometimes it's going to take a while to develop the sensor that you want. So rather than, rather than sort of Rather than sort of wait for that, maybe you can find other ways or alternate ways to sense. And we made a lot of use of imagers as sensors. Um, uh, so using cameras as biological sensors. So like I said, we had instrumented bird boxes so you can watch the, the phase of life of a bird. Um, well, somewhere in there, you'll, uh, the projection's kind of bad, but you see birds sort of dancing around. You see eggs, then eggs, and then the bottom picture on the bottom of the little bird's mouths looking up saying, mom, come on already. Some food, please. Um, Here's the better picture. Um, and then we can track things like the cycle of life of, of, of birds and see how that's changing year after year, what is the effect of climate change, and so on. Um, imagers were also used uh, as various plant sensors. We famously trained a camera on a, a patch of moss, which has got to be the most uninteresting picture in the world. But the <laughs> idea that with rain, the moss gets green, starts to give off CO2, you can sort of track CO2 output and sort of calibrate the image and the color of the moss with the amount of CO2 output and anyway. Um, and then that led to the idea of, well, maybe instead of using just specialized imagers, maybe you could scrape um, you know, a network of public webcams and watch things green up across the continent and see when spring moves across the continent instead of depending on uh, uh, sort of large pixel um, remote sensing, you could do it from the bottom up. And gliders to sense algal blooms, algorithms for, for sensing that, and, and so on. Um, all of this ends up getting wrapped up um, in sort of lar a series of sort of large terrestrial observatories. These are sort of government investments that put lots and lots of sensors out to track things like climate change or urbanization. Um, NEON is one particular network. You can go and see data of various kinds. Um, oh, and I put this in to just remind me that um, in addition to uh, uh, all of the work we were doing on sensing and so on, that these are ultimately computer systems that need to be managed by humans. And so we also spent a lot of time thinking about these things as computer systems and what do debugging tools look like when you have all of these different, different sort of robotic and static and all these different components in one place. Um, all right, so I'm going to close with just the, the human system part. So we spent a huge amount of time, about a, seven and a half of the ten years, um, uh, working on ecosystems and observing ecosystems from root systems to, to, to plants and to other sorts of um, uh, 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 movement of animals to, to human systems, using the idea that the mobile phone, over the time that we were in place, became more and more powerful um, and became a more and more uh, a, a sort of a better improved uh, carrier of, of, um, of, uh, of, of sensing technologies. Uh, we started speculating on what sensing looks like when it leaves the woods, when you're no longer spying on a bird, but there are humans involved in those images. Um, 
uh, and like taking it into the home. So um, you can, for example, looking at electrical draw, see when the refrigerator door is open um, because electrical appliances have certain signatures so you can start to have a look at what's being used when. Simple sensors for monitoring water usage when you don't have access to something on the end, but instead using the vibration of pipes to correlate with the amount of water that might go through them um, and such. Uh, we then, instead of just sort of sensing in the home, started to involve people with the sensing. So there was a, a strand of, of our work that was participatory in nature, that is encouraging people to, to contribute to sensing projects. Um, uh, um, everything from uh, tracking diet to, on the right over here, uh, documenting uh, when you know, sort of unwalkable or unpassable paths um, uh, on Los Angeles streets, not that anyone walks in LA, but if they did, there would be a problem. Um, and again, this is the this slide again, the, the current, this moment where the cell phone stops looking like that and starts looking more like this is when we gave over to those, to those sorts of projects. Um, uh, and, and one of the early ones that we, that we worked on was um, looking at your personal exposure and impact um, as you're sort of driving around in Los Angeles. And rather than sort of use a lot of kind of magical thinking sensors, sort of personal, uh, personal air quality sensors which, don't, that which aren't sufficiently sensitive to tell you anything about what you've, um, well, okay, you're standing in the middle of a forest fire versus you're standing in, I mean, it can maybe do that, but aside from that. So <clears throat> we ended up just using, milking the heck out of, of GPS traces. So use something about your car, use something about how fast we estimate you're going to say something about the kind of crud you're giving off. Use something also about the neighborhoods you're in to tell you something about where you're giving off that crud. Is it near schools, hospitals, and so on. Um, oh, that was awful. Um, and then we also contributed to citizen science projects, things like what's invasive, where you're invited in, in, na in national, national parks to take pictures of um, or identify species that don't belong there, right? So you're taking pictures, you're identifying, but you're also learning something about the system. So there's a kind of informational return from these participatory systems that's, that's important. Um, and then we, we finished with the, the, the whole sort of the whole, as SENS was sort of on the way out, uh, we took the idea of participatory sensing and brought it to uh, computer science programs in LA Unified School District to, so that students, the, the, the students started to collect, design their own sort of data campaigns and collect their own data and do some basic analysis. Um, I should add that, that, that SENS at its end finished with, or we've left with, this educational mission. And Deborah Estrin, who um, was the, the principal investigator, has gone on to, to start something called Open M Health, which takes the idea of personal data collection um, and applies it to, um, to, to, to health, uh, to questions of health. Um, um, uh, and openmhealth.org is where you might go there. And then, and then I transitioned to a school of journalism. So, um, so anyway, to finish then, some thoughts about all this, the oh, horrible old man talk. Um, so uh, uh, one thing to notice is as, as, as we went from dust metaphors to sort of humanly curated, human in the loop kind of systems, participatory systems, as the, as the concept of a sensor network changed, so did our view of the sensible world and what that meant. Um, data handling and data quality are two huge issues that I'm sure everybody has to deal with. Larger systems call for better programming, abstractions. Um, visibility into the system, whether it's participatory or official science, is also key to knowing. And then it's never too early to get to know a statistician. That's the <laughs> last lesson. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>